waves of the Pacific, persistent, perpetual, driven by the winds and tides across this largest ocean. Their echo is somehow reassuring. Nature seems a friend of man. But there are other waves, infrequent and unfriendly. the destructive oceanic offspring of earthquake and eruption. And as they are born of cataclysmic change, they occur with greatest frequency in the Pacific, engendered in that ocean's circumferential ring of fire, the Earth's most active seismic feature. From the volcanoes and island arcs and trenches of this seismic belt, has come a legion of destructive oceanic children. Their deadly record has been kept. Man has noted the fear and desolation brought upon him by these waves, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of his fellows. Their record has been kept, and they have been named for what they seem. Some call them tidal waves although they are not related to the tides, or seismic sea waves for their origin in earthquake and eruption. But the term used internationally is borrowed from the Japanese, tsunami. not the nature of our planet to be still. A timeless continuity of change and movement must be sustained. The waters must make their endless journey, and the Earth adjust to the great pressures of internal tides and alterations. Each movement, each adjustment, marks a point in a process, a step toward or away from equilibrium. It is as though the planet breathes, and each change is another respiration. And so on this early morning, while coastal towns lie sleeping, and earth and sea experience their constant change, a process that began centuries ago nears its inevitable conclusion. Southwest of Kodiak, Alaska, adjustments in the earth's interior have produced tremendous strains along its crust. A block of crustal material the size of California has been gradually forced into an unstable, strained position and is held there by the strength of its rocks. Now in a zone of weakness 20 miles beneath the ocean floor, this structure reaches the critical limit of its strength. More strain will destroy it. In a few minutes, the supporting rocks must rupture and the fractured block's two sides will slip toward equilibrium. The shock will be felt in Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. Its vibrations will echo through the Earth. It may disturb an ocean. Another great tsunami may spread across the sea and in its wake leave terrible destruction. If a wave is generated, it will not take islands and coastal settlements unawares. For today, men and instruments are watching and waiting. They will detect the tsunami if one is generated before the earthquake is two hours old. And to the people of the Pacific, they will give early warning, the gift of time. They wait and watch today because on April 1st, 1946, a severe earthquake in the Aleutian Trench triggered one of the most destructive tsunamis in recent years. Because its 100-foot waves surprised the lighthouse at Scotch Cap, Alaska, and killed the five-man crew. They wait and watch because those same waves struck Hawaii and killed 159 persons, injured 163, 
and did $25 million property damage. That tsunami came without warning, as the great waves had always come to Pacific Islands. And to many, the disaster must have seemed just another natural tragedy. A group of scientists within the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey did not share this view. To them, there was nothing inevitable about such loss. Tsunamis, these men believed, could be detected and predicted with sufficient reliability to provide early warning for Hawaii. In 1946, a tsunami warning system could be envisioned, but it could not be implemented. Seismographs were needed that combined the visible record of older instruments with the accuracy and sensitivity of modern photographic recording units. A visible recording seismograph was developed that satisfied this requirement. Units of this type were installed at Coast and Geodetic Survey observatories and at other private or governmental installations in this country and abroad. But an effective warning system required more than seismic evidence of tsunami generation. A group of tide stations in the Coast and Geodetic Survey's Pacific Network was selected to ensure a means of confirming tsunami generation. And a new item of equipment was developed that discriminated between tides, wind-driven waves, and tsunamis. Tide stations at Hilo, Midway, and Dutch Harbor were equipped with tsunami detectors and automatic tsunami alarms. Travel time forecasts for tsunamis are possible because of the direct relationship between wave speed and ocean depth. The deeper the water, the faster the wave. Tsunamis may travel at speeds exceeding 600 miles per hour through the deepest ocean depths and at 30 miles per hour in shallow coastal waters. A warning system would need tsunami travel time charts, accurate ones. Traditional applications of the tsunami speed depth relationship had not provided the necessary order of accuracy. But by refining this technique, travel time charts were developed to an accuracy of two and three tenths percent, about a minute and a half per hour of estimated travel time. Charts were drawn for Hawaii and other points in the Pacific. These charts and the development and deployment of suitable equipment made a tsunami warning system possible. Communication links provided by the Civil Aeronautics Administration, now the Federal Aviation Agency, and the military services made it a reality. In 1948, the seismic sea wave warning system was put into operation with its headquarters at the Coast and Geodetic Survey's Honolulu Observatory. Its immediate objective was the provision of early warning for the people of Hawaii. Today, there are more seismograph stations and more tide stations and detectors. And the communications networks of the Federal Aviation Agency and Defense Communications Agency have been augmented by the global system of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And there is a larger mission. Tsunami warnings were initially sent only to Hawaii. But in the years since 1948, participation in the system has increased. Tsunamis respect no national boundary. The participation of each new member helps man cheat the great destructive waves and contributes to the safety of life and property across this broad Pacific. For the day is past when tsunamis of distant origin can come upon an island or coastal town and take it unawares. Today, someone is watching and waiting in this quiet place. The seismograph makes its silent track, while buried sensors await the signal of some distant cataclysm. And now the waiting ends.
In this shadowed land, 20 miles below the ocean floor, a new adjustment must be made. The energy of strain is yielded up as heat, sound, motion, and earthquake waves. A gigantic block of crustal material thrusts 50 feet vertically. The ocean floor is altered. And the sea itself. This seismogram is the earthquake signature. Each deflection of the recording pen represents the Earth's vibration. Because the propagative characteristics of earthquake waves are well established, the time interval between the arrival of different types of earthquake waves can be used to compute the distance from the seismograph station to the source of the disturbance. This distance is computed for Honolulu Observatory. Other seismological data come in from participating stations. The intersection of these arcs of distance is the earthquake epicenter, the point on the Earth's surface above the subterranean source or focus of the earthquake. If this point falls on or near the ocean, and if the magnitude of the earthquake is sufficient, tsunami generation is possible. Estimated times of arrival, ETAs, are calculated from travel time charts. Epicenter here, one and one half hours to Dutch Harbor, two hours to Kodiak, four and a half to Crescent City. An advisory bulletin is issued to all warning system participants. Civil defense and other responsible authorities in the Pacific area can take preliminary steps necessary to prevent loss of life in the event of a destructive tsunami. But the existence of a tsunami must be confirmed. In the open ocean, the tsunami has a height of only a few feet and a length of 100 miles or more. Ships do not feel its passage and it cannot be seen from the air. Detection of the tsunami comes as it enters the shoaling waters of coastlines in its path where wave velocity diminishes and height increases. Here, even small and non-destructive waves can be readily identified. At the Dutch Harbor Tide Station, this gauge records the oscillations of the tides. The tidal record, or marigram, shows the smooth rise and fall of sea level produced by the attraction of the moon and sun. Below the tidal record, a pencil draws an endless line. This is the recording apparatus of the tsunami detector. The arrival of a tsunami is often heralded by a gradual recession of coastal waters. 
or by a rise in water level of about half the amplitude of the subsequent recession. This is nature's warning that more severe tsunami waves are approaching. This warning has begun at Dutch Harbor. The confirmation from Dutch Harbor reaches Honolulu Observatory. The tsunami warning is issued. It is impossible to predict with any certainty the size the waves will be, the time interval between them, or their destructive capability. All the warning system can do is give endangered people time. A few minutes for those near the earthquake epicenter. A few hours for those 2,000 miles away. Time. For thousands of people around the Pacific, this gift of time means the difference between life and death. Now the gift has been given. The warning goes out to prefectures and provinces and counties, to ships and islands. The tsunami is two hours old. Time is running out. Decisions made here in the next three hours and the cooperation received will determine whether lives are lost in this town on this morning. It is uncertain business. There is no assurance of a catastrophic wave. A large wave has not hit this coast in many years. The tsunami may arrive as a scarcely detectable surge, or it may crush the town under tons of rushing water. A maximum danger must be assumed. If nothing happens, if the tsunami spares this town, there will be some criticism. There will be talk of hysteria, perhaps, and for those who hold elective office, pressure at the polls. These are the occupational hazards of all who deal in the protection of life and property. But there is no choice. One does not gamble what he cannot afford to lose. It will be a busy morning. Potentially endangered areas must be evacuated. Safe areas are designated and evacuation routes. The coast highway is sealed to incoming traffic. The town's Red Cross shelter is opened. Hospitals in low-lying areas notified of the emergency move patients to higher floors. It is too early for radio and television to do much good. Nevertheless, all night stations cut into their programming to warn the general public. For a few minutes along this coast, the boom and beat of entertainment cease. The following is a civil defense bulletin. The United States Coast and Geodetic Survey has confirmed the existence of a potentially destructive seismic sea wave, which is expected to strike this coast at 7.30 this morning. The danger may continue for several hours after the arrival of the first wave. These waves may cause severe damage and heavy casualties in low-lying areas. All persons in danger areas should evacuate immediately to safe areas and remain there until an all-clear has been issued by civil defense. The following is a civil defense bulletin. The United States Coast and Geodetic Survey As minutes pass into precious hours, the town wakes up.
Emergency workers must go from door to door, explaining the dangers, the risks, the fearsome possibilities. And time is running out. Ships move toward deep open water. They will be safe there. And there is time to move them. Some remain at their moorings. These cannot be helped. A group of sleepy people stir restlessly in the designated safe area, standing along the seawood cliff watching and waiting. They are the first evacuees, and their number grows. Not much is said. There is some nervous laughter, some complaint. And here and there, a child cries. Finally, all that can be done is done. The town waits, and the land and the sea. Then the waterline advances up the beach and recedes like a short and sudden tide. This is the first wave of today's tsunami. The second wave arrives minutes later, the waterline moving farther up the sand before draining back to sea. As with the first wave, the rise of sea level is too small, too gradual to be alarming. But the runoff of the second wave continues. The ocean floor is exposed almost to the mouth of the bay. And there, as though it is the ocean's very edge, the churning wall of water advances toward the town. The first major wave of the tsunami. town and all. The third and fourth are the worst. The seventh does some damage. Part of the town is burning, part of it is gone. Seven persons are missing and presumed drowned. Two are injured. They had been evacuated, but returned before the third wave. Time has run out, and it is not yet 10 o'clock. Remember what you see here. It is the work tsunamis do. It is the work they did in Seward, Valdez, Whittier, and Kodiak, Alaska, and Crescent City, California, after the catastrophic Alaskan earthquake of March 1964. It is the work they have done in Chile, Japan, and a score of Pacific Islands a myriad of times. Perhaps the great waves have never touched your town, but perhaps one day they will. Remember what you see here. It is the work tsunamis do. It is the work from which you must escape when you receive the seismic sea wave warning system's gift of time. This town, call it any town on a Pacific coast, has been substantially destroyed. And for these people, it is a numbing and bewildering thing to see their town in ruins. Now they must share a loss as they have shared a vigil but they are alive. If there had been no warning, how many would survive this day? The great waves cannot be stopped, but they can be cheated. They've been cheated today. The people of this town persist. With help, they will rebuild. 
Survival is a tradition of the species. Agencies of government, private institutions, and industry apply their vast and varied resources in support of that tradition. Part of the effort is educational, like these publications and this film. Part of the effort relates to new equipment, like this three-component seismograph at Honolulu Observatory. But most of the work must be research. Research aimed at improving our fundamental understanding. There are no easy answers here. The earth and oceans are complex. The nature of their interaction is difficult for man to see. In the meantime, the tsunami watch will be kept and the people of the Pacific warned when the great waves cross this largest of all oceans.